What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No. Shall we pray? Our grace and Father, we thank thee for this time and the opportunity we have to come here this evening and study another portion of thy word. We ask you to be with the teachers as lessons they prepared for us and the students. We as students will listen attentively to the words that's being brought to us and apply it to our lives. We also pray for our upcoming meeting. Pray for Brother Charles Blair as he's about to leave Indiana and come here. We pray that he have a safe trip there, from there to here. We know he's going <clears> to <throat> teach the truth there, and we pray that the lessons he's prepared will help benefit each one of us. Can you be with us through this service? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening and welcome to the midweek Bible study period here at the Bremen Church of Christ. We're so glad to see each of you here this evening, especially those who may be visiting with us. Before I dismiss the classes, I have something that I wish to bring to the attention of the congregation. Brother Chad got a call from one of our dear sisters in Christ, Mindy Rutledge, earlier this week. Mindy had stated that she's not been living the kind of life that she needs to live and being the Christian example that she needs to be and the wife and mother that she needs to be. And it's my privilege at this time to take her name to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Kind of gracious Father, we're thankful that we have this opportunity to meet with those of like precious faith. We're thankful for the sheepfold of safety and the time and the health and the ability and the opportunity that you have allowed each of us here to come and be in this place at this time. And dismiss those worldly things from our mind and concentrate and focus on our purpose here, which is to study more about that word. Father, we're thankful for the teachers that have prepared lessons. May it fall on good and honest hearts. Especially, Father, at this time, we're mindful of our sister, Mindy, and we're thankful for her desire to be the kind of mother and wife and member of thy body that she desires to be and she knows she needs to be. We're thankful for her understanding 
<clears throat> we're thankful for her desire to do this. May we be good examples to her. May she be good examples to others that she has influence on, and may we draw strength from one another. We're thankful for the gospel and the power of it. We're thankful for people with soft and tender hearts, such as Sister Rutledge, that it can penetrate so well. Father, continue to watch over and care for us as we study more from thy word this evening. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's dismiss to our classes now. We'll ask the teachers, preschool, nursery, and elementary school to go at this time. <clears throat> Middle and high school. Kind of rig this thing tonight. No, it's not. I think that looks like Seth. Ashley. Ashley may be missing her Bible tonight, Chris. I said Ashley may be missing her Bible tonight when she gets to class. It's sitting right there. All right, we are studying in the Minor Prophets. We've had a, we've had a what, two-week break? I was gone to Memphis two weeks ago, and then we got to hear the lads to leaders and leaderettes, see some of the progress that they've been making. That was a, a treat for us last week. Of course, they've done an excellent job, as we knew they would. And I believe somebody said more participating this year than we've ever had, right? That's good. We've, I, I think, I don't, I don't know, I can't think of anything off, right offhand, but I think we will have the rest of the weeks leading up to the summer series, which of course, Lord willing, will begin in June. But... Uh, we may have to condense a few of these minor prophets because uh, we are just, man, there's, there's so much good material in here. Uh, but I may just, uh, and if, if worse comes to worse, nothing else, I can print out my notes or a, or a good summary outline or something like that and, and leave it with you so at least uh, we don't just observe the Passover on a particular book. Have you ever wondered why do the wicked prosper. A lot of things seem to go well for those who are wicked. That's the subject of the book of Habakkuk. That's where we left off last time. We were getting ready to, <clears throat> to, to begin this study. And I, I have a note here um, that we're beginning with Habakkuk but I'm looking at some of my notes here on the introduction, and they look they just sound familiar. Maybe that's just because I've been studying them. But did we start introducing the book? Yes. Yeah. We did? Yeah. Okay, I thought we did. Uh, did. I just, I don't remember now. It's been too long. I've slept since then. Um, I, I know, I knew, I, I knew some of it sounded familiar to me. Um, just, just, I'll hit some high points here just to make sure we're, we're refreshed. But uh, this, this book can be dated by two, two events that are referenced. Of course, Assyria uh, has, has fallen because the Chaldeans are in power when the book, is, when the book opens. Uh, the, the Assyrians fell in 612 B.C., so we know it's after that. <clears throat> but Babylon in this book has not yet come against Judah. That happened in uh, 606. 
And so it's sometime between 612 and 606. Uh, that's, that's about the best we can do as far as the date. Uh, but, you know, as I just mentioned, Habakkuk wants to know why do the wicked prosper? <clears throat> and not only that, why do the wicked prosper and why do the righteous suffer? So that's, it's the age-old question, as we sometimes say. Uh, reminds us of Job who asked that question. Gideon at one time asked that question. Remember, the um, angel of the Lord appears to Gideon, and uh, Gideon is, and he's not being rude or disrespectful, but he just basically says, <clears throat> if God is with us, why is all this happening? Uh, they were being oppressed, and of course, you study the book of Judges, and you see that cycle where they would fall away from God, and uh, God would allow the heathen nations in the land to oppress them and punish them, and then they would cry out to God in repentance, and God would send a judge. And of course, the heathen nations who oppressed them were not supposed to be in the land anyways. Why? <clears throat> they were told to drive them out. They didn't do what they were supposed to do in the first place, and, and so God warned them if, if they didn't drive them out, they would turn their hearts away from God. They would be a thorn in their side, so to speak. Uh, so you see that come to pass. But uh, even, even early Christians had the same question. You see that in the book of Revelation. You've got this group that they're saying, how long before you avenge the blood of these martyrs who died for your cause? Uh, you can almost hear these souls. They're, they're saying, God, these people were killed just because they were Christians, just because they were trying to serve you. Uh, are you going to do anything about that? And again, it's not they're being disrespectful. They're not being unkind or belligerent toward God. They just, they wonder. Uh, and one of the things that I read, uh, I guess it was on a blog somewhere on the internet <clears throat> not that long ago, and it said, uh, I don't know, the article was something like five things we should stop doing or something like that as Christians. But one of the things that it mentioned that we should stop doing is stop reprimanding people, Christians especially, for having honest doubt. Now, if we are going to be truthful, I don't think there's a single person in here of accountable age and intelligence who can say, I've never, ever questioned. Maybe it was, is there a God? Maybe it was, does God really care? Maybe it's, maybe it's a time of, sickness in our lives, maybe it's a time of sickness in a loved one's life, maybe it's death, <clears throat> whatever it may be. Uh, we all have had times where we doubt. That is, you don't find God getting on to his children, reprimanding his children for honest doubt. These are not people shaking their fists at God and saying there is no God and you know, you, you see atheists sometimes make the statement, well if there's a God, why doesn't he just strike me dead or something like that. Not, we're not talking about anything like that. We're talking about people who want to do what's right. They have good hearts, but in a moment of darkness, <clears throat> they, they wonder. And that's what you see with Habakkuk in this book. And so it is, a, uh, it is one of the more relatable books of these 12 so-called minor prophets because we all have been in that situation at some point where we say, okay, God, I... And maybe even not even questioning the existence of God. Maybe you say, God, I know you're there, but why? I don't understand this. I want to know. <clears throat> maybe even say, give me some answers. Maybe we dig and dig in the Word of God, and, and, and maybe we don't find the answer in the way that we want to find it, and, and it frustrates us. And again, that's, that's sort of what you get with Habakkuk here. As far as <clears throat> lessons from the book... Uh, I can't remember if we discussed these or not, but very quickly, <clears throat> God disciplines his people. Sometimes the righteous suffer with the wicked because God is disciplining his people in some cases. Um, evil will be destroyed. Now, that's not to say that that's always the case. And if you watched uh, Kyle Butt's debate with Bart Ehrman, then you, you saw some of that. He tried to say, <clears throat> so every time, and of course, the debate centered around evil, pain, and suffering. And, and one of the things that he said was, <clears throat> um, so sometimes in the Bible I read about God's punishing people, and they suffer because they're being punished by God. So, and he, he even used the illustration, and, and, and it was, I believe, at least a purposeful appeal to emotion. And he talked about children starving in Africa, and so, so I guess they're being punished by God. 
Well, nowhere in the Bible does the Bible say, or does God say, that every time someone suffers, it's chastisement from the Lord. It doesn't say that anywhere. Is it sometimes? Yes. <clears throat> Particularly here in Habakkuk. There are some righteous people who are going to suffer with the wicked because God was dealing out punishment to his nation, his people as a whole. But that's not the only reason why people suffer. We could, really, we could take a sidetrack and preach an entire sermon on why do people suffer. Sometimes you suffer because you, you made a dumb decision. You did something that was very foolish. And, you know, that, that happens all the time. You know, when we were kids, when y'all were kids, maybe, you did things that were foolish. Um, you know, and even sometimes as adults, we do things that are silly and we get ourselves hurt or injured or things like that. And we say, you know, I can't, I can't really blame anybody but myself for that. And so that's sometimes why people suffer. And sometimes we suffer because of other people's foolish decisions. You see that happen a lot as well. And it's a lot of times children suffer, innocent children, because of their parents' sinful, just idiotic, is about the only way you can put it, decisions. Sometimes it's chastisement, and on and on we could go. But <clears throat> God disciplines his people, and sometimes the righteous suffer with the wicked. Second lesson from the book is that evil will be destroyed. Uh, number three, God is aware of evil. God is not turning a blind eye. And, and it may seem like that to us because we're not on his timetable and we don't, have, uh, we don't have full knowledge of what's going on in the grand scheme of things. <clears throat> For instance, in Habakkuk we're going to see that. Habakkuk doesn't see the big picture. Uh, there was no way for him to see the big picture except that in this book God reveals it to him. We don't always know the big picture. So God is aware, though, and that's, that's one of the things that we see in this book, and, and he is just. Uh, four, evil is self-destructive. We see that over and over again, not just here, but throughout the Bible. Uh, number five, suffering has to be kept in perspective. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the bulletin articles recently, but <clears throat> there's there's been a series. I think there's been, uh, I've combined some of them, so I'm trying to remember. There were six total, I think, uh, that have run so far, counting the one this week. Uh, some of them have run together. I think it's been in three different bulletins. But um, uh, Daryl Broking is the guy's name that wrote these articles, and Daryl and I went to preaching school together. And uh, Daryl has endured a lot in, in his life and uh, various trials that he's gone through, and, and it shows in these articles that he's written. They're, they're excellent articles uh, dealing with Elijah and, and what he went through suffering, but then looking at it in a big picture perspective and how it helped turn him into the man of God that he was and that we remember him for being. So suffering has to be kept in perspective. <clears throat> Number six, I believe. God is not bound by our timetable. We talked about this a little bit already. Number seven, we learn from this, uh, a specific verse actually in this book, the just shall live by his, God's, faith. <clears throat> and then we learn to trust in God at all times. And, of course, you're going to see that as far as an outline of the book, uh, really it, it starts off Habakkuk questions God. God answers Habakkuk. You know, Habakkuk says, why does God allow such evil? God says, well, the Chaldeans are coming. And then Habakkuk questions God again and says, well, you know, they're more wicked than Judah. And then God answers Habakkuk again and says, well, Babylon will be punished as well. And then the book closes with a song of praise to God. And Habakkuk, he, he understands now, at least more so than he did. I don't know that we could say he had a perfect understanding of things. <clears throat> Denny Petrillo from Worldview Bible School gave the outline of chapter 1 uh, down to verse 3 of chapter 2. He calls that section, Watch and See. And then chapter 2, 4 through 20, he calls stand and see. And then chapter 3 is kneel and see. Interesting outline. But getting into the text, I'm going to try to cover as much of this as we can tonight. In fact, I'd like to finish this book. I don't want to get too greedy there. But <laughs> Verse 1, the author is given. Of course, this is Habakkuk. Uh, again, we see that in chapter 3, verse 1. Interesting thing to note in this opening is that, and you'll see this when you get to the end of the book, the book opens in gloom, as one writer said, and it ends in glory. It's a, it's a very, very marked contrast. <clears throat> Verse 2, uh, Habakkuk implies here that he's been crying to God for some time, wondering 
if God is off in some remote corner of heaven not caring about his children? Uh, you know, if you want to, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty plain what he's saying there in verse 2. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Are you there? Are you listening, God? You ever wondered that? You ever wondered, God, are you even listening to me? Well, Habakkuk wondered that. And again, nowhere in this book does God say, how dare you? God understands that part of the frailty of humanity is that sometimes we just wonder. And sometimes we are, we are frustrated in the flesh because we don't understand all things. And part of that is learning to trust in God and know that he's going to take care of us. And that's one of the things that Habakkuk will say as this book moves on even though there are things that I may not ever know, at least not this side of heaven, I can trust in God and know that as Abraham said in Genesis 18, 25, the judge of all the earth will do what's right. May not understand everything. But honest doubt is not being reprimanded by God just for the fact that Habakkuk wonders. But he basically says, you know, where are you, God? Do you not see all of this? He saw these things going on that he describes in verse 3. People aren't keeping the law, verse 4. And he doesn't understand why God doesn't discipline his children. He's saying, <clears throat> I don't understand, Lord. Why are you not taking action? Have you seen our nation? And, of course, you know, we, we look at it from our standpoint and we say, well, how foolish of Habakkuk to say, have you seen this nation? Well, God sees everything. But, again, bring it to a personal level. Think of some time in your life, a dark time, a depressed time, and you, you maybe even said to God, maybe prayed to God and said, do you not see how down I am and what shape I am right now? Do you not see it? Do you not care? And those are questions that in any other circumstance we would not even hesitate to say, of course God sees. Of course God cares. But in that circumstance, we're wondering. We're doubting. And that's where Habakkuk is right now. And then verse 5, God answers. He says he's going to act, and it's going to be within Habakkuk's lifetime. I notice God, again, he's not reprimanding. He just answers the question very frankly. He says, and he implies at least, I see it, and I'm going to take action. And it's going to be within your lifetime, Habakkuk. God has already disciplined Judah. How, how has he disciplined them? <clears throat> think about uh, I, don't, I don't have the reference here and I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now but uh, Second Chronicles or Second Kings 1 toward the end of the book I can't remember if it's Second Chronicles or Second Kings but toward the end of that book says he sent his messengers the, the prophets right to them betimes, rising early. So God has disciplined Judah through the prophets. Now, some of what you're talking about as well, but uh, I'm specifically thinking in terms of, we, we sometimes think of discipline uh, as the corrective action. Sometimes we even think of discipline, you talk about disciplining a child. What are you talking? Spankings, groundings. But discipline also comes in the form of a warning, doesn't it? Uh, you know, we may tell the child, if you do that again, you're going to get a spanking. Or if you do this again, you're going to be grounded or whatever the consequence may be. That's discipline, that statement, that warning. And, of course, God over and over again sends the prophets. We've studied several of them already just in this course, looking at all the discipline that God's giving, warning them. You're going to fall. You're going to receive corrective discipline if you don't make things right. The, the punishment kind. And so God has disciplined them with the prophets, but it didn't work. So now it's time for stronger discipline. Uh, and in fact, God says it's going to be so severe they won't believe it if they're told. And that shows how severe this coming judgment is going to be. And I can only imagine if you're in Habakkuk's shoes, you're thinking, you know, I was expecting something. I mean, I was expecting God to act, but I wasn't expecting this. Be careful when you ask because you might find out the answer and it might be something that we don't want to hear. 
And that's the case with Habakkuk. I mean, he asked this question, are you not going to act? And God says, oh, I'm going to act. I'm sending the Chaldeans, and it's going to be in your lifetime, and it's going to be so severe that you wouldn't believe it if I told you all the details about it. <clears throat> it was going to be intense. There's an interesting quote of this verse, by the way, by Paul. Um, who's, who's got a Bible handy? Somebody look up Acts 13, 41. <clears throat> a little bit of a different application here. We, we've seen that sometimes uh, in other, other books of the minor prophets, as we refer to them, where a verse will be taken and given a little bit different application Who's got that? Acts, what did I say, 1341? Yeah. Yes, sir. Behold, ye despisers and wonder and perish, for I work the work in, in your days, the work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Back up and get verse 40. Back up to 39. <laughs> and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Back up to 30. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I'm flying blind here. I, I, I just had verse 41 in my notes. Um, Paul's talking about there, the, he's, he's talking to Jews about the salvation of the Gentiles. It's going to be, salvation is going to be made available to all. And then he goes on and he quotes from Habakkuk. And it's just, it's amazing because the fact that God would bring in Gentiles, and again, remember how prejudiced some of the Jews were, most of the Jews, I think it's very fair to say, that it was equally unbelievable to them, just as unbelievable as it would have been to Habakkuk, that the, this Gentile nation is going to come in and, and not just, you know, I mean, we, we, we talk about Habakkuk's amazement because of the wickedness of the Chaldeans, that's true, but also... He, he, was, he had national pride, and so it would be because this is a Gentile nation. And so it's just unbelievable that God would bring a Gentile nation, and then on top of that, a Gentile nation that is exceedingly cruel, exceedingly sinful. It's just unbelievable. Well, it was equally unbelievable to the Jews in Paul's day that God would dare to extend salvation to those Gentiles. And you see the, the wrong attitude that they had. But an interesting little twist on it there by Paul in Acts 13. Uh, getting back to Habakkuk. <clears throat> God says, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. Uh, hasty is a reference to the fast rise to power of Babylon. I mean, they, they rose to power very quickly. Again, Deuteronomy 28, uh, they were warned, Judah was, or, or Israel at that time, the entire nation before the split. They were warned that they would be driven off the land if they were disobedient. Verses 7 and 8 is a description of the Babylonian army, army's power, their dreadfulness. Uh, you have pictures of speed here. Uh, I mean, pictures that are painted for us. There's the leopard, which, you know, of course, signifies the speed. Then there's the evening wolves, the wolves attacking. That would imply fierceness. And then the, uh, the birds of prey, the eagle that hasteth to eat. The last part of that verse says, verse 8, uh, it's the speed of a swooping bird of prey. So it's just pictures that are painting the, the swiftness, the fierceness of this coming army. Um, there was a, set, a phrase in verse 9 I was looking for. I've got tiny print here in my notes. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, right, the second little phrase there in verse 9. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind. This is one of those that's rendered significantly different in the American Standard Version and some of the other versions. Uh, they have the set of their faces is forward. Seems to be a better translation there. And, and the idea is they are going in one direction, and it's forward. They're not going to retreat. You're not going to turn them back. This is interesting also because you remember it wouldn't have been terribly long before Habakkuk's time that an army came against Jerusalem. Whose army was that? The Assyrian, uh, Assyrians and Sennacherib. They came against, they laid siege against Jerusalem, and what happened? Hezekiah, he turned to God, unlike so many of the other kings, and he asked for God's help. 
And so God says, I'm going to respond. And, you know, the story, an angel of the Lord went out, and 185,000 soldiers were killed. Sennacherib went back the way he came, just like God prophesied through Isaiah that he would. So that army was turned away. God says, this time they're coming, and their face is set in one direction, and that's forward. They're not going to turn back. They're not going to slow down. They're coming, and they're coming hard. So the set of their faces is forward. Verse 10 they shall scoff at the kings. Judah's defenses are going to be a joke to the Babylonians. Uh, their defenses are going to be nothing. They're not going to stop them. They won't respect. They won't spare the dignitaries. The princes shall be a scorn unto them. So the idea there, they won't, they won't respect or spare the dignitaries. In fact, you see that when you read about the account of Babylon invading. Uh, they quite the opposite. Uh, they took the king. They killed his, uh, they, they killed his sons in front of him, and then they put out his eyes. So uh, you, you see the, the cruelty. They don't have any respect. They'll say, oh, look, this is the king. Mate. We should be nice to him. I mean, he's royalty. And he says, they're not going to respect your dignitaries. We might say they're, they're going to clean house when they get there, the Babylonians. Verse 11, he's going to the king of Babylon, of course, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he's going to credit his success to his own god imputing this, his power unto his God, into that verse says. And, of course, that's going to be his downfall. Now, every indication is when you come to the book of Daniel that he's going to learn better, specifically chapter 4, remember. Uh, he seems to have learned that the most high ruleth in the kingdoms of men. God said he was going to teach him that lesson. But his downfall is going to be crediting his success to his own God. Verse 12, you have Habakkuk speaking again. He asks, asks a rhetorical question. He's going to reference two great attributes of God here, God's eternality and God's holiness. He, he says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? <clears throat> Referencing God's holiness and, and his eternality. We shall not die, he says. In other words, God's not going to uh, obliterate Judah. He is, he is correct, there is a faithful remnant, of course, that's going to be uh, preserved. And that's why he says at the end of that verse, thou hast established them for correction. You haven't established them for obliteration, but this is discipline. <clears throat> so the, the faithful remnant, of course, is going to be preserved, and we see that over and over again in Scripture. Then verse 13, he says, You're of pure eyes than to behold evil. You can't look on iniquity. How do you look on them that deal treacherously... And hold your tongue when the wicked devours the man more righteous than he. In other words, Habakkuk says, how can you use the Chaldeans to punish Judah when they're so much worse even than Judah? I mean, I know Judah's bad. We're in bad shape, Lord. But how could you use a, even a more wicked nation to punish us? How can you do this with your holiness? Is kind of the question that he's asking. We're bad, but they're so much worse. Verses 14 to 16. Make us men as the fishes of the sea. Well, the Chaldeans went fishing for men. And then, of course, they, they sacrificed to their nets. Verse 16. And the idea there, sacrifice to their nets, they trusted in themselves. Uh, they worshipped themselves, in other words. And, of course, <clears throat> remember in chapter 4 of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, what's the last thing he says before he becomes like a wild beast? And he has to learn his lesson. Yeah, even though it was prophesied to him by Daniel. He had the dream, remember? And Daniel told him what the dream meant and warned him. And yet he still comes in and he walks in the palace and you can almost just see him looking around saying, boy, I might have really done well for myself. Look at this place that I have established and I have built up this kingdom. And, and God is, you know, I guess for lack of a better term, scoffing at Nebuchadnezzar and saying, you didn't do anything. I did that. You know, over and over again in Scripture, in fact, that's a recurring theme in Scripture. Now, you look at how many times there are great miracles done by the prophets in the Old Testament, and it's connected with the phrase, that they may know that I am the Lord, that they may know that there is no other God, that they may know that there is none like me. God says over and over again, not just to Israel, not just to a specific nation, but to all people for all of time, God wants us to know, I did that. You didn't do that. I did that. 
And whatever you have accomplished, you've accomplished because I have allowed that. And I've given you that blessing and I've given you that privilege. But you didn't do it. You know, Pharaoh had to learn that lesson. Pharaoh thought he was pretty high and mighty. But God says they're going to know that there's no other God in all the earth but me. Elijah, boy, it happens all the time in Elijah's reign. Uh, not his reign, but his prophetic work. It happens all the time where he'll perform a miracle and he'll say, you need to know that there's no other God. But these Chaldeans or Babylonians, they would, they would sacrifice to their nets. They trusted in themselves. And so now, Habakkuk says, Shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? Are you going to allow such wicked men to keep prospering God? Here he is again, and he's questioning. Again, this is an honest man who is not trying to get in the face of God. He's not trying to have a debate with God. He's just saying... Are you, are you kidding me? You're bringing them to punish us. I get that. We're, we're wicked. We're evil. We need punishment. But then you're just going to bless them, and that's that? And the Chaldeans are just going to get off scot-free, as we would say in our day and age? And, of course, again, it's that age-old question. Why do the wicked prosper? How can you do this, God? You are holy. You are just. How can you do this? And in chapter 2, you're going to see the patience of Habakkuk. God is going to answer that last question in chapter 1. And of course, remember, the chapter breaks aren't there in the original. But he's going to answer that question. How come you're letting these wicked men keep on prospering? He's going to answer it in the form of five woes that are pronounced upon the Chaldeans. And so he goes on, and, and again, no, no rebuke here. He understands. God, God knows. He made us humans, and he understands there are, there are frailties inherent within the flesh. And some of that is not understanding because we are not omniscient as God is. And so if we keep that in proper perspective, it is not a sinful thing to wonder, to even ask God, why is this happening? I may not even, I may not even know. I may not even find out the answer to my question, but just asking that question is not wrong. Now, if I decide, you know what, I don't have the answer to my question, God, I'm done with you, I don't even, I'm not going to believe in you anymore, or if I am going to believe in you, I'm just going to decide that I'm not going to follow you because I don't get the answers that I want to my question and then just turn your back on the Lord, then, then there, obviously that's a problem. But wondering and questioning is not inherently wrong. And somewhere along the way, I think uh, many times we, we maybe have, have missed that. I know there were times... Uh, when I was younger, that I would have similar questions, uh, maybe in a, a situation where I'd lost someone close to me or something like that, uh, and, and I felt like, uh, and, and again, this may be one of those situations where it wasn't necessarily what I was being taught, it may have just been my own misunderstanding, so I'm not trying to lay that on somebody else, but I at least felt really guilty for even having those thoughts. And, and uh, you know, you, you beat yourself up over it, and so here you are, you're already depressed, and, and you feel even more depressed, and it just kind of compounds when, when God never chastises someone for being human. That's just part of humanity. We have questions. We wonder. And sometimes we even feel alone and wonder, God, are you there? And so God's going to answer Habakkuk in the form of these woes that are pronounced upon the Chaldeans. <clears throat> so in verse 1, Habakkuk says he's going to wait for God to answer. I'm going to stand upon the watch, set me upon the tower, watch to see what he'll say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Reproved there means literally, <clears throat> it's the concept of argued with. Now, <laughs> it's not saying, Habakkuk's not saying, I'm just going to sit here and wait and, and, and I'm ready. Me and, me and God are going to have a debate. That's not the idea here at all. He's just asking. And he says, I'm going to wait patiently for my answer from God. I know God's there. I'm going to wait for this answer. And so he is answered, verse 2, and he's told to write the answer down. Possibly, uh, I would say probably, this book. Make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Uh, it's not the idea of running away upon reading it. What it is, what, what this is saying here, and it's kind of awkward wording, uh, I'm not sure what other versions have. It might be a little more clear in some of the other versions. But um, what's the New King James say at the end of that verse, somebody? Uh, verse 2, very end of that. Anybody got a different? Anybody got an ESV? Same thing. 
The idea, though, and that's, that's a little bit awkward wording that doesn't really... But, but what it's saying is make it so plain that you could read it as you run by. You know, we might say, write it in all caps. Write it in bold print. Make it big font so it's easily readable, it's easily understood. Even a guy who's flying by as fast as he can go, he sees it. Make it plain. That's, that's what he's saying. The judgment is sure, verse 3. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. He says, uh, and back up just a little bit before that, he says, wait for it because it's coming and it's sure. Verse 4 is perhaps the key verse of this book, quoted in the New Testament numerous times, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, Hebrews 10.38. The just shall live by his faith. Chaldea, Babylon, is puffed up. They're lifted up with pride. Contrasted, of course, with the just faithful remnant who will live by faith. And so the faithful are distinguished in that they live by their faith. Do we have moments of doubt? Do we have moments of confusion? Do we have moments of questioning? Yes. But those moments don't define us because we're living by faith. That's not to say we're never going to have the same, same as we often say. That's not to say that when you're a Christian, you're never going to commit a sin. We, we do. We all do. But that doesn't define me. What defines me is that I'm a child of God and I'm striving every day to do what he would have me to do. And I make mistakes. But when I do, I, I make it right. I try to do better. That's what defines me. And that's why when you get to 1 John 1, 7, he says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Because that's what defines us. We're walking in the light of God's word and we're striving to do what he would have us to do. The just shall live by his faith. Getting on into verse 5. Uh, he's talking about Babylon here. Babylon is, uh, seems to be saying at least that he's, he's basically drunk on his own pride. You ever hear the expression, death and hell are never full? People sometimes use that expression. That's the way it was with Babylon. They could never satiate their desire for conquest. They always wanted to go after somebody. And that's the way many of these nations were. We saw that already with Assyria when we studied Nahum. Babylon's going to become a proverb, verse 6 tells us, a taunting proverb against him. And this is the first woe. Woe to him that increaseth that which is not his. This is against their aggression. They're stealing from other nations, constantly going after other nations and taking that which did not belong to them. Their conquered people are going to be Babylon's fall, of course, uh, Shall they not rise up suddenly that shall bite thee and awake that shall vex thee? And you'll be for booties or for spoil unto them. The charges here are brought in verse 8. They've spoiled many nations. They've shed men's blood. They've committed violence. And the verdict is given. Babylon is going to be spoiled. And of course, I seem to recall somewhere else a man who wrote, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. They're going to reap what they have sown. <clears throat> the second woe is pronounced, verse 9. This is against their covetousness. <clears throat> you see that, woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house. Verse 10, he tells them, you've sinned against your soul. They're destroying themselves. When we live lives of sin, we destroy ourselves. The city's going to cry out like Abel's blood. Genesis 4, of course we read about that. The third woe is pronounced in verse 12, building a town with blood, establishing a city by iniquity. Uh, verse 14, I have a note in, my, uh, note in my notes that says messianic, question mark. I don't know. <clears throat> Might be. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Of course, Jesus came and revealed the Father. May very well be messianic. I, I don't know. The fourth woe is in verse 15. Boy, we've got to speed up. Babylon is able to intoxicate or, or intimidate other nations because of her strength. Uh, you see the condemnation here of giving wine to others. Uh, you, you see a verse like this, and it, and it just it's almost insulting. It's almost blasphemous to even think, coming over to John chapter 2, that Jesus would have made intoxicating wine. Uh, wine, in the course of the New Testament, can be translated from that word oinos, <clears throat> it, it may mean alcoholic wine. It may mean just grape juice. Context has to determine. 
Based on this and, and many other verses, uh, there's no way that context would allow for alcoholic wine. Verse 16, he says, As you've done to others, it'll be done to you. Uh, 18 and 19, the vanity and the foolishness of idols. This is the fifth woe, of course, their idolatry. Verse 20 is a contrast between God and, and idols. They are vain. They're worthless. But God sits in his temple, judging, working, living, unlike any of those idols. God is in his temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him, not the other way around with you idols. Silence is the idea of respect or reverence, letting God speak, recognizing our dependence on him. No matter how bad things get, wicked people departing from the truth, things like that, God is still on his throne. No matter how th bad things get in our nation, no matter how bad things get in my life personally, it might be family difficulties, it might be job difficulties, it might be health difficulties, it might be loss of a loved one, nations, congregations, individuals, God is still on his throne. We've got to remember that. And that's verse 4, the just shall live by his faith. God's always going to be on his throne. Chapter 3 is a prayer upon Shigayanath, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, that word means literally to stagger like a drunken man. And, and what it is, that what that means, is it, it's a type of poetry that weaves back and forth through ideas. It's staggering back and forth through ideas. It's a style of poetry. Uh, Denny Petrillo, I like what he said. He calls this prayer, quote, Highly emotional, poetic psalm. It is stormy, martial, and triumphant. Habakkuk has been answered by God, and he now understands at least more so than he did, and he is in awe. And so he sings praise to God. He's seen that God can be stirred to anger. He asks God to remember mercy in his anger. Verse 2, he says, I know God can be stirred to anger. And again, anger is not an, an emotion with God. It is a decision, an act of his will. But when he acts, that is frightening. And so Habakkuk asked God to remember mercy. Teman is a city located in Edom. Verse 3, <clears throat> Par Paran is a mountain plateau west of Edom. Selah here is a musical break. This was a song that he wrote. And of course, use of instrumental music uh, in the Old Testament was authorized and even commanded. Uh, so the instruments, th this is a command for the instruments to take a break. It's like a, I guess we would call it maybe a rest uh, in our uh, musical terminology now. Verse 4, horns are referenced. The horns represent power. Think about God's power. Look at the water cycle. Look at the food cycle and so on. They, they never run out. They never get out of balance. He's upholding everything. What would, what would life be like on this earth without God for just one second? I mean, it would just be complete chaos without God's hand holding everything together. Uh, he, he upholds all things, Hebrews 1 tells us, by the breath of his power. And just the word of God holds everything together. Verses 5 and 6 are God's rule over both man and nature. All these nations that he references in verse 7, though rebellious against God, they're handled by the all-powerful God. All the oppressors of God's people, including Babylon, would be punished likewise. God came with great power to bring salvation to his people, verse 8 tells us. Verses 10 and 11 are interesting. Nature itself responds to God. <clears throat> verse 13, the ultimate fulfillment of this is in the Messiah. So in that sense, we could say it at least ultimately is a messianic passage. God had fought for his people and he will fight for them again. Verse 16 is interesting. He, he says, When I heard my belly tremble, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered into my bones, and I trembled in myself. He is physically shaken because it's going to happen in his time, and now he must wait for the coming destruction. That's very hard knowing that this is going to happen to your nation. And again, that shows us written prior to 606. Rottenness entered into my bones, he says, trembled within myself. He is literally nauseated at the thought of this. And you know, if God's against somebody, you ought to be afraid. Very, very afraid. And then finally, verses 17 to 19, biblical hope here. In spite of all this, Habakkuk says he's going to glory in the Lord. The final trust on how to feel during all of this is to trust in God no matter what. That's still just as true today, folks. When we go through issues, like I said, na nationally, congregationally, personally, keep trusting in God. It's not bad to have those honest questions, but just keep trusting in God. Verse 19, victory upon the mountaintops. Not fear and defeat in the valleys. 
Joy is not based on circumstances, but on an inward relationship with God Almighty. What a great book. I wish we, I wish we had more time to pick that apart. Uh, but a lot that we can learn from the book of Habakkuk. Uh, Lord well, next week we'll move on uh, to our next book and try to, try to cover some ground as we did tonight. Thanks, y'all. Come on in here, y'all. <coughs>Give you an update on some of those that have been on our prayer list. Here's an update on Sister uh, Smallwood. She had her back surgery today. Her daughter tells me that the surgery went as well as the doctor wanted it to. She came through her surgery very well. She's now in room 171 at Tanner and Carrollton. She's in a lot of pain, as you can imagine, at this time, but she'll be in the hospital for the next couple of days and then in rehab at the hospital for a while, don't know exactly how long, but the most important thing right now is her surgery is complete and it did go well, according to the doctor. Joan Thurman is scheduled to have some eye surgery this coming Monday, the 21st of April. Mindy Rutledge asked us to remember her father, Mr. Carlos Payne. He had heart surgery bypass two years ago, but he's experiencing some health problems again. Last the leaders and leaderettes, there is a mandatory meeting. All those that are participating, especially parents and chaperones and so forth, Johnny wants to meet with everybody going uh, immediately after services this evening in the fellowship hall. So if you're taking some folks or if you're participating in Last the Leaders, please be in this meeting after services tonight in the fellowship hall concerning all of the necessary 
this is where you need to be and this is what's going to happen and so forth. That'll be tonight after evening services, last of the leaders meeting in the fellowship hall. Our gospel meeting is coming up Sunday week. That is a, uh, April the 27th. We'll have a door knocking campaign the day before. That's Saturday the 26th. We're hopeful that as many of you as possible can be here so that we can canvas the entire city of Bremen and knock on a door and invite folks personally. In connection with that, many of you may have already gotten some of these, but we'd had some business cards made up that you can distribute amongst your associates and family and so forth. We've got just a handful left. I'll leave them down here on the Lord's table if you wish to gather some of those for distribution. Again, our gospel meeting is Sunday, April 27th through Thursday, May 1st. Charles Blair, the speaker, the feeding the preacher schedule is in the bulletin. But again, Brothers Keepers Group 1 feeds him Monday night, 2 Tuesday night, 3 Wednesday night, Group 4 on Thursday night. We'll have a potluck after the morning service. That'll be Sunday week, the 27th. Brothers Keepers Groups 1 and 2 are asked to set up, 3 and 4 are asked to clean up after the event. The Good Samaritans will stay for a pot after the potluck and work on their project after lunch. Our youth rally is also almost upon us. That will be the first Saturday of May, May the 3rd. Youth rally beginning at 9 o'clock goes through mid-afternoon, approximately 3 p.m. Thanks to everyone who offered donations to the plea from Brother Edwards Sunday morning concerning the two uh, children that Jim Waldron brought to our attention. Uh, if you have money that you wish to continue in that effort, we'll certainly take those through next Sunday and then forward that on to Brother Waldron. You can uh, give that to one of the elders, to Chad or to Randall. You're asked to continue to remember our food pantry. We have some um, sacks with lists in the, in the uh, foyer and also bring canned goods to classes downstairs. There's a contest going on right now for that. Whoever wins that will be getting a pizza party in May that uh, one of the Brothers Keepers groups will host. Concerning Brothers Keepers Group, Group 2, Stephen and Lee's group, there's been a change in the time and location. The date's still the same, which is Saturday week, April the 26th. It'll be from 2 to 4 o'clock at the home of Eric and Mary Blank. Sign-up list is in the foyer. And if you have uh, yet to sign up, you're asked to do so and bring something concerning the project. Group 1, Jake and Julie's group, will meet Saturday, May the 3rd, Little Tallapoosa Park, 5 p.m., come early to fish, ride bikes, hike, trails, and so forth. Next area-wide singing will be a week from Friday, which will be at the West Georgia Congregation. That's April 25th, 7 p.m. will be the start date and time for that. Brother Chad. <coughs> Any of y'all afraid of heights? I see. Oh, there's more than that. Got to be. Uh, I am. I, I didn't used to be. I used to climb uh, trees when I was a kid. In fact, we had, my parents still have a big, gigantic magnolia tree uh, in the backyard. And I used to climb that thing and, I mean, literally be swaying over because I'm so high up and it's so flimsy up that high. And it never bothered me. Uh, but now, I mean, Brian, y'all break out that big however how many feet ladder that is that you get up to that projector with, and I'm really thankful when somebody else volunteers to go up that ladder because it just, I don't know, I, I don't like it. But uh, sometimes there, there are people that they like to, to get up to the edge of a cliff, you know, and, and they, they like to get up and, you know, it's like I want to see how close I can get. I don't know what that is. It, you know, it's almost like I'm going to stare death in the face and say, not today. But some people, they, that's, that's a thrill that they have. Incidentally, I was thinking about this, and Johnny and Melanie and I were talking, uh, laughing after the fact, because it was not funny at the time. But uh, from our vantage point during the gospel meeting, Brother Brinkley, this, this pulpit is on wheels. And I don't know if Brother Brinkley was aware of that or not, but he kept rolling that pulpit dangerously close to the edge. And it scared me to death a couple of nights because he'd just be preaching up a storm. And, I mean, that thing was inches. And I could just see it and Brinkley to just toppling off of the stage. But sometimes people like to get right up to the edge, don't they? And I was thinking about this. I've been to the Grand Canyon. I've been able to go there once. 
And would, would you believe, tragically, I might even say foolishly, there have been 685 deaths at the Grand Canyon. People who got too close to the edge and fell. You talk about a tragedy. Not all those deaths, I'm sure, are from falling off the cliff, but many, I, I, probably even most of them are. And sometimes as Christians, though, we get a similar feeling, don't we? We walk right up to the edge of the sin cliff. See how close we can get. Maybe we're curious. Maybe we're foolish. But no matter, that's why so many people fall into sin, isn't it? You see, Christians need to stay away from the sin cliff. We need people that are fleeing that. So, sometimes we, we get ourselves in situations where we're getting right up to the edge of the cliff. Uh, you know, why do we put ourselves in those situations? I've, I've known of, of people, young and old, that get into a situation where they go to a, a party. And they know there are things that are going to be going on there that they don't need to be involved in. And they say, well, I can go and not be involved in that. That's, that's just like walking up to the edge of the Grand Canyon and just seeing how close I can get. Maybe I'm going to even hang my toes over the edge. And just, you know, I lean back on my heels and let my, let my toes hang off the edge. How foolish. Sometimes we do it in other situations. Maybe it's a, a young man or a young woman we shouldn't be going out with and we know they have impure intentions. Well, I, I can do that and I can be strong. Maybe we put ourselves in a dating situation or otherwise in a situation we sh just shouldn't be there and we're saying I want to see how close I can get think about this sometimes with our young folks and things that go on at school dances and such as that but we, we don't need to be trying to get right up to the edge of the sin cliff you think about Joseph Joseph didn't say well you know how far is too far I mean when is it really adultery right Joseph got out of there he fled Genesis 39 Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22 Flee youthful lusts. He doesn't say, look, Timothy, just know where to draw the line and you, you can go right on up to it. He says, get away from that. We need to flee away from the sin cliff. We need to be alert. We need to resist Satan, understanding that he is seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5 8. We need to abstain from every form of evil, 1 Thessalonians 5 22. We need to look for the way to escape the sin cliff. 1 Corinthians 10 13, God will provide a way of escape. It's important for us to have a good, healthy fear of sin. Now, if you're not afraid of heights, that's, that's of no real consequence one way or the other. But brothers and sisters and friends, we need to have a good, healthy fear of sin. We need to understand what it is, what it does, what it costs us, and what it costs God in the form of sending his son to this earth to die for sinful humanity. What we need are Christians who are afraid of heights who are afraid of the sin cliff. Not trying to tiptoe right up to it, but staying away from it. What about you tonight? Where are you? Are you trying to get right up to the edge of that sin cliff, or are you staying as far away from it as possible? Maybe you've gotten too close to it, and that's something that you need to take care of. Might, might be in a personal way, might be in some kind of a public way. Maybe you're teetering on the edge and playing with fire, as we sometimes say, because you've never submitted to Jesus Christ and obeying the gospel. If that's the case, you need to get away from the edge of that cliff. You need to come give your life to Jesus Christ in repentance. Confess that he is Lord. Have yourself baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. You do that, he'll add you to his church. There's a reason why we often talk about the church being a place of refuge, a place of safety. Because like those cities of refuge that we read about in the book of Joshua and other places in the Old Testament, it is just that. It is a place of refuge away from the danger, the eternal danger of sin. Where are you right now? I hope you're not dangerously close to the cliff and trying to see how close you can get, but I hope you're trying to stay as far away from it as possible. Maybe you need to come into the city of refuge, obey the gospel of Jesus Christ tonight. I pray you'll do that. Maybe you need to come back to the Lord and say, I'm, 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 I'm tired of trying to walk the line and see how close I can get. I'm going to get away from the edge of the sin cliff. That's why heaven's invitation is extended. If you need to respond, do it now as we stand and sing.
Beyond the slender parting losing and leaving far beyond the losses dark reminisces and far beyond the taking and the reaping lies the summer and the bliss let me Let's pray. Dear, kind, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you, Brother Chad. Pray that they continues to uh, preach the word and do a great job here at Bremen. Thank you for our elders. Lord, pray that pray that continue to lead us down that path and that path, and pray this for us as Christians that we stay away far away from that cliff as possible. Also, dear Lord, please be with Johnny and Melanie and, and all the other adults that are leading the last leaders this weekend. Pray that the the kids have a great week and a. A great weekend. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.